All right, thank you. Um, hey all, uh, my name is Martin. I work for Cake Solutions, a BAMTech media company. And today I'll talk about intelligent system uh, optimizations. Um, <coughs> so as a motivation, which one, of, which one of these two code snippets do you think performs better? The one on the left, the fold left, or on the right, the, the while loop? Yeah, probably the while loop. I, I don't actually know. I don't think I've ever tried, but it also throws an exception. So I guess what I'm trying to say, <laughs> what I'm trying to say is um, optimizations are difficult, um, and th there's a lot hidden in the background that that's often difficult to identify. But don't worry, I won't talk about any of that throughout the rest of the presentation. I'll talk about optimizations at a higher level, uh, optimizations uh, using intelligence, using using machine learning. So most people, when you talk about intelligence, they assume we're talking about performance, but we can optimize other things as well. Things like uh, reliability, uptime, and cost is, is one thing we often want to optimize. And there are different levels. So we can optimize at the code level or logical, physical level, but we'll talk about the highest level um, using, using intelligence. Um, I do have some TensorFlow slides um, in the talk. Um, but I only have 20 minutes, so if you don't know TensorFlow, I apologize in advance. I'll just go through it so quickly, you won't even have time to be confused. <laughs> um, so machine learning these days is used in many areas. Uh, it's used for stock market predictions, object recognition, or even self-driving cars. Many, many interesting business um, areas. Very often when you go to a, um, to a website or a, like an online store, they track what you do. They track your clicks, they track how long you spend on each, on each page, what do you search for. And they try to improve the, uh, your experience. They, they try to uh, optimize the experience for you um, as, as a user. And we're talking about something similar, uh, but using um, a distributed system. So we are used observability data. Um, so data like logs, metrics, traces, or anything the system produces. And we'll use that data as an input for a machine learning to a, to a machine learning algorithm and try to use that to um, analyze what the system is doing, understand what it's doing. And when we know what it's doing, when we understand it, we can try to define some actions and improve the system in certain direction, whether that's cost or performance or something else we care about. And all of these things mostly matter um, at scale. So, uh, you know, if you have a, um, a small retail shop and you're um, your system goes down for, a, for an hour, that's a major hit for your business, but it will probably cost a few hundred thousand dollars, a uh, few hundred or thousand dollars. But if your system has dozens or hundreds or thousands of machines, uh, and it's a huge system, and it goes down um, for a period of time, it may cost you hundreds of millions of dollars. And, and uh, the opposite is also uh, true. So if uh, Google managed to um, improve uh, the electricity usage of their data centers by 15%. So if your household uh, is able to decrease their, its electricity usage by 15%, you probably save a couple of dollars. But for Google and the scale, at the scale of their data centers, they were able to, to save hundreds of millions of dollars a year just because of the scale. So the scale amplifies uh, the effect of any optimization we can do to our system. And it often becomes about finding the balance. Not about, we, we don't want to build a perfect system. Uh, what we're aiming for is aligning the risk taken by a service with the risk uh, the business is willing to bear. So we're finding the perfect balance. Sometimes they, there's a known issue in the system that can happen very, very rarely, but it may not make sense to fix it because the impact is just not worth the effort that it would take um, to fix that problem. Um, but the important thing here is it has to be an explicit decision. You can't just uh, have a system full of holes and if it goes down just say, you know, whatever, that was expected. You have to make the decision explicitly. You have to make know about those issues. So you should still build all the good things in your system like reliability and delivery guarantees and, and you know, consistency um, and choose the correct consistency, validate it. You should all do, do all that still, but sometimes you may choose not to implement some things. So machine learning is already used in many um, large-scale systems for various things. So these are some of, some of the applications that are uh, already researched or even uh, used in uh, many systems, such as no, no, node assignment, cluster scheduling, and resource management. Uh, these are common problems in, in large-scale data centers. Uh, uh, serverless insta instancizing, um, automated scaling, or uh, uh, you know, data mining in the data to understand what your system is doing. Uh, these are common use cases. We'll talk about today about configuration, which is a uh, bit less common use case, but it's nice to explain some of the some of the concepts. 
So this is a, a very simple Apache Spark job. Um, it's a common machine learning pipeline. Just loads data from a file, splits the data into two parts, um, training and testing data set, and then defines a simple machine learning model, in this case a multi-layer perceptron, um, and then uses the model, uh, it trains the model, and then uses the, uh, the, the testing data to validate that model's performance on a different data set. It's a very, very common machine learning pipeline, the basic um, training of a machine learning model. But there are two things to notice here. Firstly, uh, we defined some attributes here. So we defined a number of layers. We defined some other parameters of, of, of the training uh, procedure. So how, do, how, do, how did we set those uh, values? And at the same time, Spark has a variety, like a huge number of configuration values. So it's just a small subset. This is around 20 configuration values, but there's many more. How do we set those? What, which, what is the best combination? So the first problem, uh, parameter and hyperparameter optimization, it won't, we won't talk about. There's a whole field of machine learning around uh, learning to learn and meta-learning. But we'll talk about how to optimize these um, configuration values to improve the runtime of, of the Spark job. Um, these are random trials um, with different combinations of those 20 configuration uh, parameters. And you can see that the, the values we set, they affect the runtime performance of the Spark job quite significantly. You can see that the difference is somewhere between 10 and 90 seconds. So that's a huge difference uh, based on just configuration. So how do we find the best uh, configuration? Um, an engineer might think, all right, let's try all possible options. Um, but Considering we have 20 uh, configuration properties, each of them can have, let's say, let's say just five possible, five possible configuration values. Um, and a random trial takes around 20 seconds. It would take 60 million years to try all possible combinations. So we tend to release new versions of our software a bit more often than that, although not always, right? Um, it's also a trivially parallelizable problem. So if we run it on 10,000 machines, it will just take 6,000 years, still still not perfect. And also it will likely be more expensive because I expect the price of, uh, the cost of computation to go down over the next you know, million years or so. Um, so this is not an option. We need to be more intelligent about this. One option, uh, the most commonly used option is to use supervised learning. Um, supervised learning is uh, probably the most commonly uh, used area of machine learning where we have labeled data. So in our case, the features are the configuration values. Um, so it's a vector of 20, uh, 20 configuration values. Uh, and the label is the runtime, the time it took to run that, that job. Um, and, our, and the goal of the supervised learning algorithm is to figure out the function from features to labels. And then given a new label it has not seen before, it should be able to predict the correct label um, and if we, if we can do that, we can optimize that function and find the best combination of, of, of features that produce the lowest possible label. Um, if you look at this as a human, um, it's fairly difficult to understand which of these 20 configuration parameters affects the label and in what way. But the well, that's what the machine learning algorithms are fairly good at. Um, but to be able to imagine it um, uh, for a human, this is a simplified example where we only have one um, configuration parameter, uh, broadcast block size, and on the vertical axis we can see the time uh, it takes to run the algorithm. And we can see that bro broadcast block size affects the runtime quite significantly. Um, and we can, we can fit a machine learning model to represent this function. So linear regression probably is not the best fit, uh, but even a simple polynomial represents the function reasonably well. Um, so we know that the best value uh, that uh, has the lowest runtime is probably somewhere between 1 and 8,000. And we can do the same in a multidimensional space. Um, here we have two uh, configuration parameters, uh, broadcast block size and the number of executor cores. Um, and we, we are again trying to find the minimum of that, of that function. We could either, uh, again, try a uh, brute force search and try all possible combinations or use a more intelligent approach such as a gradient distance. So try to find the minimum of that function. And here's a, uh, a TensorFlow example of how to do this. Um, you know, if, if you don't know TensorFlow, it allows you to fairly nicely um, write a code that represents the, the actual mathematical equations. Um, so you can see here that 
we're defining the, the neural network. Um, and so the weight is a, a matrix, um, then biases is, 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 is a vector of, of numbers. And we use x, which is the input, the, the, the vector of size 20. So these are, it's, it's the, the configuration values that we, we feed in our machine learning algorithm. And the output of the machine, or of, the, of the neural network layer, um, is we multiply the input with weights, add biases, and run it through a ReLU in, um, activation function. The second layer is exactly the same, but um, for the input, we don't use the input to the network, but we use output of the first layer as an input to the second layer. And the third layer, again, the same, but at the end, we don't use the ReLU function because this is a uh, regression problem. So uh, this allows us to produce the output. And the training algorithm itself is, is fairly simple. So we define um, placeholders. So uh, we define a way how we read the data. Um, X uh, is the input, Y is the output of the neural network, and Y with underscore is um, the expected uh, output. So it's the, the real label. Um, and then we define a gradient descent optimizer. So uh, we define how we optimize the neural network. And then in a cycle, um, we read batches of, of uh, examples, and we feed th those examples to the neural network. Uh, they the neural network predicts an output. And then we compare the predicted output with the real label and feed the difference back uh, to the neural network so it can improve the, the, weights, um, the weights and biases and try to learn how to represent that function better and better. So over time, it should improve, and it should learn how to represent that problem uh, fairly well. So eventually, um, the, the network knows how to represent the function from features to labels. Um, and therefore, we can find minimum of that function and find the best combination of parameters for this particular Spark job. So problem solved, right? Um, but what problem did we solve? We solved a problem where, given a lot of data, we were able to find the best combination of that data. Likely, if we took the best combination from those random trials, it would be very close to the optimal solution anyway. So the really, really difficult problem is here is where to get the data. Um, there are some more in interesting solutions. And also, if, what if the Spark job changed? So if the, if the code changed, would the, al the algorithm still work? Probably not. So we would have to try to generalize it a little bit. But let's talk about a more general case. Um, here we have a, an example of a large scale system. Please don't try to find anything in it. It's really just an example. Uh, but we have Akka HTTP that publishes some messages to Kafka. Then we have Akka cluster that consumes messages from Kafka and uses Dynamo as an event source journal. Uh, it also sometimes <laughs> triggers a Lambda function, because why not? Um, we also have a microservice um, has already sketched and a database behind it. So the, the problem with this this system is, is very complex. Um, it's also long running. So we can't really try, uh, we can't really run random trials. We could run some performance tests, uh, but that doesn't solve the problem because the system is, you know, many of your systems, you start them and you don't, uh, they, they run forever. Um, and they evolve over time. Um, they, we deploy new versions of the system. We change the communication patterns. We change serialization. Um, and many other things within the system. So we would need something that learns over time and evolves with the system. There's also a large number of variables. Um, each of these systems, so Kafka, Akka, HTTP, CockroachDB, and all of these, they have different configuration values. They behave differently. They have different uh, uh, failure domains. They, you know, they behave differently under load. So they're very different systems. And there's, there's many variables that we can tune, uh, and many of them are unknown. There are also many possible actions can, for example, change configuration of Akka HTTP or add more Kafka nodes. Um, and the reward is often temporal. So we don't know if the change we made was good or bad uh, until after a period of time. One option how to resolve this is to use reinforcement learning. Um, reinforcement learning has been made fairly popular recently with um, because it was able to beat uh, the, the best player in the Go game and uh, learn chess and learn other games without actually playing or, or watching games of other players. It just learns the game by itself. And it works differently than supervised learning. We don't have any labeled data. It just learns by trial and error. So it, it, we have an agent in an environment. The agent 
um, takes an action um, and then is moves to a new state and receives a reward for its action. And uh, by doing this over time, it should learn how to behave in that environment. It should, it should improve its own representation of the environment and tr learn how to behave. Um, just imagine the Super Mario game where you have this uh, figure Mario and he can either you know run left run run to the right or jump and if he just you know runs into an enemy or jumps into a hole probably won't receive a lot of reward but if he can reach the, the end of the level uh, he can reward the agent for doing that and the agent should eventually learn how to reach the end of the level um, every time and the simplest way how we can represent this agent is by a matrix. One of the, the common or the uh, quite successful approaches was called Q-learning. Q-learning is represented by a matrix in its simplest form, and each of the values in the matrix represents a quality of an action in the given state. Um, and when the agent takes the actual action, like the best action, the action it thinks is the best, it receives the reward and it, it tries to improve the matrix and its own representation of how to behave in each state. But it only works in very simple environments with limited number of states and actions. So what do we want to do instead? In a complex environment where we need hierarchical actions and planning, uh, and also we have temporal reward, um, such as our distributed system case, if we scale up our system, that means we'll be paying more money. It's more costly, uh, so the reward goes down. But the system may actually handle larger amount of users if they come so the overall or the long-term reward may increase. So the system should learn not only how to um, gain short-term reward, but how to maximize the reward over time. So I created this um, gym. Um, in OpenAI terminology, gym is a, uh, a playground where you can, you can build your agent against the gym. In our case, the gym is the actual, uh, the actual large-scale system. It has the concurrent user load, which moves from 10,000, 12 to 12,000, 20,000, and so on. And also the other um, part of the state is the number of instances and their sizes. So one, one, and two means we have two small instances and one medium-sized instance. And the actions uh, the agent can take in this environment is can increase instance size, decrease instance size, add more instances on, or remove instances. And the reward uh, is the number of errors. So if we cannot handle the user load, um, that decreases the reward. And we also have to include cost, because if we didn't, the agent would very quickly learn to just keep, keep increasing the size of the system forever, uh, because that would yield the highest reward. So we need to inc include cost as well. So it tries to balance the cost against the number of errors. So this is a code of a very simple agent um, in TensorFlow. Um, it's only represented by the W, uh, which is a matrix of, uh, of numbers. Um, the agent can pick the highest value uh, from the matrix for uh, the given decision. And we also define the trainer. So in this case, again, a gradient destined uh, optimizer. Um, and the training of the machine or, or of the agent uh, is similar as before. So for a number of episodes, we iterate. And in each episode, the agent um, goes through the sequence of states. And it chooses an action uh, by picking the highest, uh, the highest Q value. Sometimes it, 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 it chooses a random action, because uh, otherwise it could just learn to, to do the same thing over and over again. So sometimes it just tries randomly. And it takes a step in the environment. Uh, taking the step yields a new reward and a new state. Um, and then we use the Bellman equation uh, and calculate the next Q value um, and calculate the uh, the, the all Q values variable here and use that to update the agent's representation of the state, um, update the matrix of, of values. And by doing this repeatedly, uh, the agent should learn how to behave in that environment and should learn um, how, to, uh, how to beat or how to maximize uh, the reward. So this is a very, very, simplified sta uh, very simplified solution. This is an example of a, an agent um, learning how to play the Super Mario game. And you can see it just, like, jumps ra randomly around for a period of time, then realizes running to the right is probably a good idea, uh, but runs into the first first enemy in the game and, and dies. Um, so and, and it can keep doing this for hours and hours before it learns that jumping over 
the enemy is actually a good idea. And we don't want our large-scale system to actually do this. We want our large-scale system to not, not to crash spectacularly. It should learn much more efficiently. So there are interesting techniques how to, how to achieve that or how to at least improve that. But eventually the agent should learn how to behave in that environment really well. So this is a trained agent and you can see it beats the game uh, actually fairly well. It just it, it runs through the game without pretty much any issues really quickly, probably better than, than most humans could do, uh, and reaches the end of the level. So this is the state we would want to achieve. Uh, try to maximize maximize the reward and uh, and beat the game. So in conclusion, um, still do the you know the optimizations in your code, uh, write good code, do all the right things about uh, you know delivery, uh, uh, message delivery in your system, set the right consistency levels, validate your system, uh, build the resilience in your system. Just do the, all the good things, but at the same time, produce data, produce observability data from your system, and more importantly, use the data. I'm not asking you to build a reinforcement learning agent, but at least look at the data and maybe try to statistically um, look at some, some, of the, some of the attributes and directions and try to optimize and improve the system um, in, in the chosen directions. Thank you. Yeah, I do. I do have some exper uh, experiments. Uh, I'm not sure how much of that I can share, but we can we can have a chat afterwards. So this was a very very basic example, um, of course. <coughs> uh, two questions. One for reinforcement learning. Do you ever use some type of state constraint uh, for training? And then second, for any classifiers that you use, do you ever use the locally interpretable model explanations from Marco Riveros, like in Western? So the first was. What, what techniques do you use in reinforcement learning to speed the training? Like, are you able to constrain the state space? And then the second one is about one. <coughs> yeah, so the, uh, the state space uh, search uh, and choosing the, uh, the strategy there is, is a, a difficult problem. So there's, there's quite a few papers mm -hmm. in, in that space. Um, you can have a chat, chat afterwards. Um, I think that's uh, yeah, behind, the, uh, behind this. Uh, presentation. Sorry, what was the, uh, the other question? Uh, the second question <coughs> was being able to explain particular like classification results, like feature importance that contributes to that particular classification by learning a local model using the LIME tool from the University of Washington. I'm not, I'm not familiar with that. 